Facebook obviously soaked up a lot of the attention this week with the announcement of their cryptocurrency, Libra. But a few months ago, JP Morgan had all the headlines when it came out with JPM coin. Tell us, what is the origin of that initiative? Sure. How'd that come about? Okay, so just to level set, uh, since it's a broad audience, uh, have, has anyone heard of JP Morgan coin here? Okay, cool. Uh, everyone. Okay, great. Everyone's heard, a lot of people <laughs> have heard of it. Okay, but does anyone actually know what it is? Okay, great. Like Fewer hands. <laughs> um, okay, so let's just level set with what it is. So um, basically, the way that you can think about JP Morgan coin, despite the name, is that it's just representation of fiat that's in your JP Morgan bank account represented on a permissioned enterprise blockchain, okay? So it's that simple, like definitely not as exciting as like a cryptocurrency, not as exciting as what you thought it was, there's no ICO, et cetera. Um, and the origin story for how we uh, decided to build JP Morgan Coin actually stems from one of the other blockchain applications we've been developing. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've been pursuing an agenda around digital securities. Uh, I guess what you guys would be calling uh, security tokens, or has been discussed as security tokens here. Um, and in fact, last year, we tested a $150 million floating rate bond issuance with an issuer, National Bank of Canada, and tested it in partnership with asset managers like Goldman Sachs Asset Management, Pfizer Treasury, uh, Western Asset, and another. And basically what we did was we modeled out an entire bond instrument end-to-end -end using smart contracts on blockchain, right? And so this is like the issuance process, syndication, the settlement, the interest payments, and the pay down. And what we ran into is that in the settlement process, you have this exchange of debt obligation for payment. How are we gonna do the payment? Were we gonna send like an instruction to send a wire and then confirm the wire and then send a message back into the blockchain to say like, yes, we received payment? Um, and, and keep in mind the goals of enterprise blockchain. The goals of enterprise blockchain are uh, cre creating if operational efficiencies, reducing reconciliations, and actually like in our investigations in the past four years or so, four or five years in, in, in figuring out the pain points of, of, of a bank, like a lot of the pain points were in, in the process of like, I received a wire, what is this for? Like, wh why do I have this? Is, this? is this the right amount? So it made sense at that point to say, like, how do we actually represent this payment on a blockchain so that we can enable this use case and make it more frictionless? And then we realized that actually most other use cases that are in enterprise blockchain also have a payments leg. So then decided that we actually wanted to build something not only for JP Morgan applications, but, but for other enterprise blockchain applications that required a payments leg. And, and, and the reason why we think this is important is because you know, we, we actually have very strong conviction in, tech, in the technology. Um, you know, our CEOs actually said, God bless the blockchain, and the blockchain yes. is real, um, despite what, you he know. He said the, less kind comments about Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> but, but and the technology he was, he's very keen on, and there we're big believers, um, you know, from the top down. But if you really believe in this technology, then you really, and you want to enable its progress, then you really need a foundational payments leg to make sure all these other applications work. It's, it's kind of like how, you know, you needed to have a fully functional PayPal-like product to enable eBay, or you needed something like Square to really enable point of sale like commerce, uh, mobile commerce, or you needed something like Stripe to enable like web, web credit, credit card uh, transactioning, right? So we just think of JP Morgan coin project as basically that foundational payments rail for enabling enterprise blockchain applications. When JP Morgan coin came out uh, and, and was announced, uh, JB made a comment, I think it was to CNBC, and he said that uh, maybe one day consumers would even have access to this. How far off might that day be? Uh, you know, one, st one, one step at a time, right? So right now, uh, we're focused on getting it to our wholesale clients. Um, and, you know, I think what's important for this group to realize is that it's really hard to do this, right? Like, uh, you know, the technology is besides the point. There are a lot of technologists here, and you understand, um, and some of you have stable coins as well. But for the hardest part for us as a very highly regulated institution who's regulated globally um, is to do this the right way, to do this the safe way, to do this the legally legal and compliant way. Um, and so we actually spend most of our time now thinking about how to do this um, in partnership with our clients. And, and so, you know, one step at a time, wholesale first. So let's hear about some of the work that's going on at IBM as well, because you have a number of projects happening, including partnering with a cryptocurrency company, uh, Stellar. They've got their own uh, crypto lumens that they use for remittances in Southeast Asia. Um, so tell us about all the sorts of things that you've got going on there. 
Well, we really have been engaged at IBM in blockchain for almost five years now because we see it as a fundamental way to build trust and transparency in all types of industries, finance being one of them. And in particular, related to finance, cryptocurrency isn't what our value proposition or what we think the real belief is. It's in creating a digital economy where you can link goods and information and transform these processes. But to have that exchange of value for all these different networks, you need a public network. You need a connection point for that exchange. So we've been operating, when it comes to digital money, in three different areas. There are transactions occurring bank to bank, particularly central banks, with the goal of digital fiat currency, which we think is the ultimate endpoint, and our work with CLS on payment netting for those top rails of all the currencies is a good example. We also see people going direct, B2B. Um, so we're working with Visa on their B2B connect and how they're using that for direct exchange between businesses for FX, so you take out some of that friction in those transactions. And the most underserved, I think we all agree, are the consumer to consumer. Remittances, sending money back home to the Philippines or wherever you want to do that. And in order to get that kind of value proposition, we've invested in Worldwire, which is live with a test net, connecting almost 50 different currencies so that you can, whether it's for a stable coin or whether it's just as a bridge token between two currencies, get that friction out of the system and enable a real-time clearing and settlement. You've had conversations with central banks as well? We do. What, are, what is their view on this, uh, the idea of tokenizing fiat currencies? Well, everyone is really looking for digital fiat. So how do you really have an asset-backed exchange? So it, to me, it's not the speculative nature of a cryptocurrency. It is how do you actually have value back to eliminate the volatility, to get greater transparency. And I think the big question now is more on the regulatory point of can the central banks and the financial, financial regulatory bodies that govern those central banks keep up with the rate and pace of the technology. We know the technology can do that. We've proven it in every one of those layers. Can we get the regulatory compliance and the trust and transparency around KYC to be part of that? And that, in fact, is what I think is slowing us down right now. Yeah, and, and I think it's uh, important to note that uh, commercial banks and central banks are working together. Uh, you know, you would have seen in the past couple of weeks there was the utility settlement coin uh, fundraising that was announced, 50, uh, 50, sterling, 50 million sterling uh, across 14 banks, NASDAQ and Clearmatics, which is an Ethereum variant uh, blockchain company. Um, and that's focused on the tokenization of central bank level money, central bank risk level money. Um, and then for us at JP Morgan, we've partnered very closely with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, who have a very uh, progressive multi-phase project around trying to bring blockchain and distributed le ledgers to reality. Um, and so we actually started them three, year, three years ago. And uh, the first stage was actually tokenizing the Singapore dollar. Uh, we actually did this on, on Quorum, uh, and proto we prototyped that, and actually has like a similar model to how you would think about uh, collateral-backed stable coins. Um, then we took it a step, step further with a multiple group of other partners um, to actually do uh, uh, to stable coin transfers with privacy, so actually writing zero-knowledge proof uh, circuits and actually... Um, what is a zero knowledge proof circuit? Oh, okay, so zero knowledge proof... <laughs> at a high uh, level. At a high level, just an academic technique for um, being able to prove some information without actually sharing the information. And the application as it relates to blockchain and value transfer is being able to send a payment and ensure that we actually have, like whoever's sending the payment has the balance to send without actually revealing the balance. So in public blockchains, like public blockchains are all transparent ledgers, um, and that's how you can you know, trust the technology and trust like the transfer. Uh, in you know, institutional enterprise, the banking system, uh, obviously we need privacy, privacy is of the utmost importance. Uh, the JP Morgan blockchain team has invested an enormous amount of time and effort in th developing blockchain te technology that has privacy. So first we forked Ethereum and added a private contract store. 
Um, and, uh, shout maybe, out to Amber Valde, who was on the stage here, who like obviously has you know driven that agenda and see her here. Um, and then you know from there we also partnered with the Zcash company. There was discussion yesterday uh, about Barry talking about privacy coins. So we actually partnered with the Zcash company um, to pioneer a private token transfer and actually also open source that work in the Quorum GitHub. And then most recently we open sourced. Um, a Zether implementation, which is another variant of zero knowledge proofs, uh, you know, and pri privacy for token transfer, and you can check that out as well. So privacy of the utmost importance for us. But anyway, back to the Ubin project. Well, hold on, let me let me cut you off right sure. there uh, because you mentioned that your uh, blockchain is based on Ethereum, mm -hmm. uh, which is a public open uh, blockchain. You made a permissioned ver uh, variety of this. Uh, Marie, you actually started dabbling with Ethereum to begin with and then decided to go on a different route and, uh, and created something called Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, why did you make that decision? Many of the same reasons. We think enterprises want to know who they're dealing with and therefore both privacy, security, and the fact that you need to own your own data and have the right to determine who gets access to it is critical. That in a public Ethereum context doesn't exist. And at the time we started, we tried to look at various other options, and there were really none out there. Um, so together with a number of different players, joined with the uh, Linux Foundation to create Hyperledger, now 300 different participants, um, just released our newest version, next-gen platform, for Hyperledger Fabric that allows you to build, govern, and operate. We have 1,300 people on it right now using it for various industries, whether it's for finance, but also for healthcare. Announced a project last week um, with the FDA for how to handle drug serialization and security. And that with Walmart, Merck, KPMG. Today we announced a new project working with our, one of our Columbia Accelerator startups, IPWE, to create an intellectual property um, marketplace. How do you actually track across 200 different um, patent offices around the world for the innovation you create? How do you monetize it? How do you share it? How do you know you're not impinging on it either? They all require access to trusted information and then exchange of value. And the combination of the two on digital money with uh, permission data sharing is really what we think is causing a tipping point in the industry this year. And, and I, I think what Marie and I would definitely agree on is that it's going to be a multiple blockchain protocol world. Um, and, I, and I think that we're already starting to see that there are certain use cases that may be better suited for Fabric or versus Quorum versus Stellar versus any other blockchain protocol, right? And um, you know, the way that I think about it is like in today's world, you have Apple computers and you have like PCs, but the main point is that you can still send an email from like someone who has a PC to someone who has an Apple, right? And that's that's what that's what's useful, right? And um, you know, to the point of it being a, a multi-blockchain world. Um, actually, one of the last stages of work that we did with the Monetary Authority of Singapore was do a cross-blockchain, cross-border, cross-currency um, exchange transfer, asset transfer, using a, a hash time locked uh, smart contract. And so I think it's interesting, like you know, like where uh, those that are working in the blockchain space, both in enterprise and in public, are really trying to push the limits to like actually evolve the technology towards interoperability or some sort of like connection points between different blockchains. So we'll and, see like a mesh network, I guess. And I would agree with that completely. I mean, we were also involved in that cross-border exchange on Ubin. Um, we just joined the enterprise um, Ethereum token uh, initiative to focus on exactly these digitized assets and how do we have consistency across platform. And Hyperledger Borough is looking at how you can take an existing Ethereum smart contract and run it on a fabric network. So, you know, one network will not rule them all, and you want fit for purpose, but I think the principles of being open, having control of your data, making sure it is permissioned and that people have the right to use the data that is shared in the way that they think is important will accelerate the whole exchange of value. Excellent. Let's give the audience a chance to ask a question or two. Is there anybody out there who uh, has a burning question they would like to ask of our panelists? Anyone at all? All right. Well, I'll toss you this question then. Give your sales pitch to the people here. Uh, why should somebody use Hyperledger Fabric versus Quorum? 
I'm going to ask you the same question after this, but uh, from the quorum perspective. You're trying to pit us against yep, each other? Yep, let's do it. We're like <laughs> enterprise blockchain friends. You can't do that. And we just said that there are going to be multiple blockchains connected with each other. <laughs> I mean, we, we think the most important point is participation. Um, the real fundamental opportunity for blockchain, in my mind, is we are now creating the ability to transform processes. Everything that we've done in the internet has facilitated exchange of communication, but everything in business today is essentially a linear process. And you go from point to point to point, whether I'm doing a handoff from me to JP Morgan to you um, on a banking transaction, you now have the opportunity to have all the participants on one network. And the ability to fold linear transactions on their side and make them a circular economy is, I think, what really is fundamentally exciting about this. And my expectation is every single business process will be transformed by blockchain. And that is not something we've seen since, essentially, the changes that you saw from the internet or mobile. Now, when it comes to Hyperledger Fabric, we built in many things that we think are important for privacy, for consensus mechanisms, for security, for tokenization of assets, and those are all fundamental for speed and scale of doing this on a global basis. So what's so great about Quorum? I would say that it's, uh, it's the, the developer community, right? Um, so Quorum, as I mentioned before, is a fork of public Ethereum, and as we know that there's an extremely robust community of developers that are working on Ethereum today, uh, to, there's, they're working on Ethereum Core, they're working on the tooling. Um, you know, I think that most of the activity that we've seen in the past couple of years in the public blockchain space has been, in, been on public Ethereum, so even some of like, the services around like, uh, private key management and other trading-related services are already built on Ethereum. So um, you know, I think that for businesses that are interested in having permissioned enterprise blockchain to solve their own problems, but want the optionality of connecting to the broader world of blockchain that's evolving um, and leveraging the robust uh, community of developers and academics that are all, have been studying um, this technology for some time, uh, that's what I see as you know, the, kind of the quorum pitch point. Excellent. I mean, I think the most important point is what value will every participant get out of permissioned blockchains? And candidly, I will love the day when nobody talks about blockchain and they just talk about the value creation that you know the 500 different projects that we've been working on around the world are really what you talk about. I agree. The benefits, the value proposition, and the participation that it is now bringing to the unbanked or the underbanked, that to me is the real value and stop the hype on, on blockchain. Yeah, I mean, actually, when I talk to clients and even like internal stakeholders, like I try not to use the word blockchain. I'm like, we're building this technology. You don't, <laughs> we don't actually say it's blockchain. I mean, everyone just knows because I'm the blockchain person, but like. The That's all we've got time for. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, OK, so we will keep blockchain in the background. It's the technology. It's the Let's problem focus on the that we're trying that to solve. Yeah, doing. exactly. Thank you both for, uh, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.